Uh, good morning, everybody. We're, we're about to turn to a topic that's even more difficult than building the technology behind Watson, which is how to make money in clean technology. And we'll give you some, share some stories with you and tell you some things that have worked and, and the challenges that remain to be solved in that area. Uh, just to get a, a sense, uh, how, how many people in the room have actually invested in or worked in these clean tech areas, alternative energy or anything related to that? Not too many. H how many are uh, out of the IT sector and came here to gloat about how much easier and, and better their sector is than clean tech? <laughs> uh, I figured that. And then how, are there, how many are sort of uh, willing to be persuaded either way and kind of on the fence on this whole clean tech thing? Okay, well, there's an opportunity. All right, so we're going to go through this. Uh, G George, as, as the introduction said, is the um, uh, vice chairman of Little Zard, runs all the energy power businesses there uh, and infrastructure. He's been very helpful to us, uh, to me, in, in, in my endeavors around uh, solar energy. And so he's going to talk to you and kind of frame the opportunity here uh, from, from, from a capital markets perspective. And then uh, I've been doing this for 10 years, uh, just by way of background, uh, co-founded and built a company called First Solar, which was a startup. And I think this demonstrates the opportunity uh, from a raw startup and $50 million of revenue in our first year to roughly $3 billion uh, today in a market cap of something north of $10 billion. So, so it can be done, uh, I would argue in our case with a lot of luck, but, but perhaps there's some things we can talk about that improve your odds of success. So George, uh, Good. So I, I think as, as Mike said, I think what we're gonna do is just uh, kind of frame the area and define it. There's a, there's a big definitional problem in this, in this industry, the alternative energy or clean tech area. It means a lot of different things. And so we thought we'd just outline that. It's a super exciting area, there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of opportunity for creativity. It's a nascent industry, um, and it still hasn't been defined uh, the way it will certainly ultimately be defined. We're going to go through uh, who the companies are in the area, who the investors are, how much money's been raised, uh, and things of that nature, and then to focus most importantly on what we think you need to know to uh, uh, be active in this area. It's a little bit different than some of the uh, other technology areas that you might focus on. And then um, an attempt at a David Letterman top 10 list, uh, 10, 10 uh, keys to success or things to think about. And so um, what is alternative energy? It means it's solar. Uh, so Mike's, uh, Mike's company uh, it could mean uh, the photovoltaic area, utility scale solar, solar thermal, rooftop solar, um, could mean wind, offshore wind, uh, onshore wind. I particularly like that picture of the offshore turbines there. It's, it's quite, quite impressive. Um, it could mean uh, traditional clean generation. So hydro power is a form of alternative energy in the minds of some. Geothermal, biomass, uh, burning wood chips and chickens and oranges, oranges and things like that. And then some people include nuclear power in the alternative energy area and define it as clean generation, which is a controversial uh, point of view, but nevertheless included in the definition sometimes. And then the uh, misunderstood and ill-defined area of the smart grid, uh, energy efficiency, smart meters, uh, smart trans transmission and uh, storage. Storage, by the way, is one of the holy grails of the alternative energy area. Uh, people have not figured out a way to efficiently store electricity, which is a, very much the key to this next area. Alternatively fueled vehicles, uh, so natural gas vehicles, a very attractive proposition in this country at the moment, not other countries, but this country. Electric vehicles and uh, uh, the related infrastructure. And then biofuels. Uh, a series of companies have gone public in the U.S. capital markets this year in this area. Um, and uh, they, they cross a wide span of, of technologies. Uh, LED lighting, uh, another big area of emerging growth. There's a large company in Germany that will be spun out of Siemens this, this year that is in this business. 
and then smart building products, a uh, series of companies will go public in the next year in this area. Quite, quite interesting, low cost, uh, produces efficiencies. Um, and then what companies are participating in this, in this area? The area cuts across the entire economy. Uh, the companies that are, we define as alternative, alternative energy focused companies include First Solar, ITRON, which is a smart meter company, SunTech, a Chinese solar company, BrightSource, which is a company that has filed to go public, solar thermal company, Enernoc, which is an uh, energy efficiency company, Vestas, a Danish wind uh, company, and then utilities, very active in the area, very important. They're the end users of a lot of these products, and one of the keys to have success in, in Mike's company has been their success in dealing with utilities. Um, IBM, they do Watson, they do uh, things in the uh, energy efficiency and smart grid area. Oil companies, a company called Total, French oil company has taken a big equity stake in a California-based solar company called Sun Power. And then uh, various Asia-based uh, conglomerates very active in the area, particularly the Japanese companies and increasingly the Chinese companies. There's been a lot of capital uh, put into this area. A couple points that are important on this page. First, total of about $167 billion invested out of the VC community into the area. The pace of investing from the venture capitalists is slowed because this is so, it, some aspects of the business are so capital intensive that it's, it doesn't lend itself to the traditional VC model. Uh, and so you see emerging uh, efforts in this area for, from large cap industrial companies uh, like General Electric, Toshiba, Google, and as I mentioned earlier, Total. And then an important investor in this area is government. Uh, government across the globe is either through subsidies or through direct investing has supported this area. The Department of Energy in the United States has a series of programs designed to, uh, to support the area. And what do you need to understand to be successful in alternative energy? Um, highly complicated uh, slide here. Uh, energy prices are very important, so uh, we will uh, meet with a company um, and they'll be in the alternative energy area. And almost the most important thing they should understand is, depending on the region of the world, oil prices or natural gas prices. Uh, government incentives, project finance, very important. Uh, the fact that it is a global business, this is not typically a regional business, it's a global business. Uh, you need to understand the end markets, particularly utilities. Uh, a lot of this stuff that people want to sell cannot be sold except directly or indirectly through utilities. Stakeholders are very important. We'll talk about that in a moment, but one can't be successful in this area, some of these areas, without roping in the stakeholders and uh, having them be supportive uh, because you're often relying on government regulation for your returns. You need to understand the electricity grid. You need to be sophisticated when it comes to technology. Um, and then also uh, manufacturing. So it's, it's a multidisciplinary uh, area that requires um, a variety of skill sets. The very successful companies we see will have a very good government relations person, a really good operator, manufacturer, someone who really understands IP and technology, someone who's good with the investors and uh, other, other skill sets. So now we come to the 10 suggestions for success if you wanted to, uh, uh, if you're in this area or you wanted to, to get into the area. So, so the first one, envision big, think small, uh, th the front end of that. I, this is a very difficult uh, space and it's capital intensive, as George said, it takes a lot of time. And I don't think the risk return makes sense unless you've got a really big idea and a big aspiration. Uh, nor do I think you'll be able to attract the capital or the talent you need to be successful. And so what do I mean by think big? Uh, you know, I think you have to start thematically. There, there are big pressing problems that have to be solved in this space. That's why the money that's come in has to date 
uh, you've got two billion people in the world that don't have access to electricity, and another billion people that have intermittent access at best. And there's all kinds of momentum, as you know, socially and politically, for upward class migration. This power problem is at the core of enabling all kinds of things that have to happen. In, in developed countries, you've got electricity infrastructures under severe strain. In, in some cases, they can't keep up with, with the demand for electricity. So in places like China and, and um, India, you already see industrial output becoming constrained. But then there's this whole climate overlay. And how do you move off of the world's mainstay as an electricity source, which is coal, into things that are clean, are low, low in carbon, and, and sustainable? So you've got, you've got a whole revolution coming our way. Uh, that says nothing about what's happening in transportation, which I think everybody's aware of. But the, the, the penetration of automobiles globally into the populations that will need them and expect them 20 years from now is, is minuscule. I mean, if you look at what's happening in China and look at the stress that that's placing on the environment and on petroleum supplies and the geopolitical issues that have crystallized here in the last 10 years, and imagine growth 5x where we are today, it's hard to see the energy infrastructure scaling at that level. Uh, water comes into play here. There, there is a global uh, shortage already. I should say global. There are regional spots where the shortage of water has become acute. There is a longer term trend over the next 20 years to where supply demand imbalances of water are going to become very significant. These, di these differ by, by region, but, but it's, it's a big deal. And it's relevant to this discussion because there's a very tight nexus between water and energy. Uh, to pump and move water requires enormous amounts of energy. To generate electricity with thermal processes requires massive amounts of water. The two problems have to be solved together. From an agricultural point of view, you've got massive demand growth for foods driven by class migration in developing countries, and specifically around high protein content diets which in turn drives uh, beef production and certain types of farming that use water and energy extremely inefficiently. And if you just look at the supplies of the raw nutrients and arable land and water and look at the demand of people expect to be fed, enjoy diets like what the Western world has, you'll see the math doesn't work and it simply doesn't scale. It, it just it cannot work. And, and the waste streams present another piece of the puzzle. I mean, what do you do with all the byproducts of all of this consumption and industrial production as it ramps up? And in a lot of emerging markets, there aren't centralized infrastructures for collecting or dealing with that stuff. So it, so it gets dumped, and the pollution has already become rampant. In, in China, every major waterway in China is polluted to the level that humans cannot safely come into contact with it, let alone use it. I mean, it, it's true. So you've got a bunch of stuff here that's only going to get worse, and the status quo doesn't scale. I mean, it just, we do not have enough resource. There's a famous study, it's famous among intellectual circles in China, done by, by a Chinese academician who concluded that if China were to achieve the U.S. level of affluence with its population, the natural resources required to support China would be equivalent to three planets, three planet Earths. And I think that was just a graphic illustration of the issue. So something has to change across all these areas. There's an opportunity for technology and innovative business models that can deliver to a customer, to a consumer, a lifestyle that they expect with a minimal draw on the resources available and do that in a distributed way without relying on the central infrastructures of the past and allow more people to enjoy better lives with fewer drain on the earth. And that should form a central thesis for what somebody's trying to figure out. Uh, in a lot of areas outside the US, a lot of markets, entrepreneurs, I think, are looking small and incremental. And you know they're trying to make a better mousetrap they don't have a broader theme in terms of where they're going. In the US, you actually see sometimes the opposite. And that's the second half of this, execute small, where 
we've seen over the last five years, six, seven years, lots of venture money funding guys with big dreams that are going to go into the mass market and make big disruptive change, uh, only to see the money, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases, go down the drain. And that's the flip side of this stuff in, in clean tech. You can't move directly to a mainstream market. I don't believe it can be done. Maybe you get lucky. It's not going to be viral like a lot of social networking. Uh, there's too much entrenched, uh, integrated system-level effects. There's politics. Uh, there's education of the, um, of, of the uh, consumer base. And so what you have to do if you have a big vision is then come back to today and say, where's a market segment? Where's a niche I can enter with what I can do today? and get some traction, ideally some cash flow, and some learning. And then I'll continue my mission. I'll figure out how to migrate from where I am today, but from a base that's, that's real. And so what we look for from an investment point of view is that combination of pragmatic, you know, reasonable market opportunity, a big idea, and a, and, a, and, a, and a will or a resolve, if you will, to migrate through these market segments and, and eventually get to a big big, uh, important, transformative change. The only thing to add to that is that um, we find, when we meet, we meet hundreds of potential comp uh, uh, different business enterprises during the course of the year, our, our firm in this area, and uh, very frequently a mistake that is made, there are two big mistakes that are made that relate to Mike's points but are said differently. One is people have not thought about how big the market is and defined the market. So. It's a really nifty, cool idea. The offices are nifty and cool, but the, but the idea, they haven't, the market has not been assessed or defined, uh, nor is there a market penetration or distri commercial distribution strategy. The second thing is that a lot of this area is driven by, what will be driven by the most cost-effective solution, and people will come up with a great idea. They may have defined the market properly, but their idea is not cost effective because frequently what is happening is you're, you're competing against a conventional generation solution or a conventional transportation solution or some other solution, but it's all about costs. And that hasn't been thought through properly. So that's another way of thinking about envision big, execute small. Uh, think low black local. Uh, I think the first solar story sums this one up. Uh, we had it, we came up with a good uh, low cost thin film semiconductor technology to dramatically reduce the cost of making solar panels. We found customers in the U.S. that would buy it where we can enter a market. But what we found is the regulatory structures wouldn't allow uh, market access everywhere we looked in the U.S. And we we really pounded on. Uh, politicians in Washington and state regulators to try to get programs changed. But in the meantime, we were spending, we were burning 15, 20 million dollars a year and, and we just couldn't get any traction. And it finally dawned on us that we have to be globally agnostic as to where we build our business because it, it absolutely critical in any of these areas is a, is a regulatory and political structure that will allow you to enter the market. And so we sent our folks out, you know, really all over the world and said, let's find the market conditions where we can get started and we'll build a company there. And so, I don't know, what has it been? Seven years later, we've got probably 90% of our people, our assets, our customers, revenue, all of our action outside the U.S. Uh, we operate in 10 countries. And I think, so I think what you have to do is think about where do I get market access, be prepared to think globally. But then once you pick a spot, you have to focus, and you have to localize, and you have to drive activity in that market. And that's the pattern, I think, in these kinds of sectors. The, the third item on this list is work with and not around the public sector. And, and this is particularly important because a lot of what is being done in this area depends on a governmental structure, a governmental mandate, governmental support. Uh, or is at, is at risk of intervention from stakeholders. And so the, the relevant alternative energy company just simply must have uh, a, a, a tremendous skill set in this area and um, figure out a way to almost be in partnership with uh, the relevant uh, governmental entity. Uh, 
I think four is probably self-explanatory. I'm not sure it's a whole lot different in this sector than anything else. It depends on your philosophy. A lot of times, you know, you're going to need more money if you're in this. You're going to have multiple rounds of financing. Uh, you should have higher valuations in the subsequent rounds because you're building more value in the business. So I'm not sure an up round is inconsistent with building fundamental value, but it can be. And, and what happens, uh, what I've seen happen a lot is you get into a couple rounds of financing and the investors start to work, it starts to dawn on them that this is not going to become viral. We're not going to be in a mass market anytime soon. We may not even be profitable anytime soon. And uh, hmm, how, how are we going to get, how are we going to extract from this thing? And uh, that's where there's pressure to start signing up big strategic partners. You know, let's go sign up a BP or a GE or this or that. And in many, many cases, those kinds of transactions deviate from what needs to be done to build fundamental value, which is really a lot of blocking and tackling. So I, I think it's a particular risk here just because of the capital intensity. I, I can't explain item five, Mike. It's Sorry, oh. Why do those uh, alliance or transactions deviate from the path that should be pursued? Well, I don't say they always do, but they do, they do in some cases. Um, well, usually, uh, when, when you come to market with some clean technology solution, it's, it's addressing a niche market of, of customers that have a very uh, significant problem. They're, they're willing to take your stuff, even though it really isn't fully vetted. Uh, and they're not, they're not exciting, and they're not big markets, but it's important to start serving these guys. So in the case of distributed energy, it might be off-grid. It might be remote village electrification. That could be a good entry point, as an example. Uh, usually, when you sign a, a strategic deal, or I've seen the kind of strategic deals that could be inconsistent are with mainstream energy, natural resource companies that are trying to get into big markets. This is only relevant to them if they can get into something big. And so you go off and chase a big demonstration project, uh, thinking, well, if we can get this done with this marquee name and all this press, that's going to lead to other big projects. It, it, it doesn't. I mean, it, it leads to one demonstration project in a lot of cases. Because the, no, but the market's not ready for, for these kinds of technologies at mass scale. They haven't proven themselves. Uh, financial markets won't fund them on the project side. And so once you spend a couple of years sort of going through that and cut the ribbon and so forth and realize there aren't any follow-on projects, you go back to those remote villages and you go back to doing what you had to do, which is just not an exciting business, you know, for a lot of big companies. In reality, there's a time and a place for that, but it's, it's after you've spent several years, you know, moving this to progressively better state, there is a right time to partner with these guys. It's just... Um, it just, and, and if it co coincides with what you think is fundamentally correct, I, I'm all for it. I just wouldn't do it to, to get the name and the bragging rights. Yeah, there's, there's two other things people do. They say, well, I'm going to partner with super multinational corporation brand X because I will get all of these stakeholder benefits. And uh, they'll help me with the regulator or the government entity. They'll help me with the government loan or the program. And it, and it doesn't really work that way. You're dealing with the venture capital arm of the big gigantic corporation. You don't get the people who are doing the government relations work with them. They, uh, they don't have the skill set that's necessary to develop a business. Uh, the second thing that can happen that's quite significant, and people have missed this issue, is let's say you want to sell to utilities. You bring in a utility as an investor. You cannibalize your customer base because you're, you're identified as Acme Utility Sm Smart Grid Co. And then Brand X in the utility in industry doesn't want to deal with you because they don't like Acme's CEO. So five and six are, are related. I mean, here's the pattern you see a lot. So you have a um, you have an innovative approach. It could be in, it could be in water. It could be energy efficiency. It could be distributed electricity. You call on a municipality uh, or a utility or, or a large industrial customer, and you start pitching this stuff to them. And, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of interested. They begin to set up meetings with you. You have discussions. But the sales cycle draws out. It becomes uh, months. Uh, wouldn't be unusual to have this spill over into multiple years. Uh, because you have so many people weighing in. There's so many things. And because of the sales cycle, uh, 
length, you, you really have to get a, de a pretty high price to be able to create margin when these projects finally do hit to cover all of your overhead. But paradoxically, the price being too high is what constrains some of the, some of the sales cycle. And people tell you, well, it, when, when can you get the price down? When can this be a grid parity? When can this make sense? And you, you get caught in a cycle. You see this a lot. Uh, one response is, well, we, we should offer more things then in our solution, in our toolkit, if we're going to call on these customers. Uh, let's try to make, you know, try to please them and also make as big a sale as we can. And you get, and that complicates the sale, which further lengthens your sales cycle. So you get caught in a nasty loop here, and it's very common in this sector to see these pipelines, massive uh, project pipelines, uh, most of which don't materialize you know, on time. Uh, they proceed very slowly, a lot of uncertainty, and, and prices, it, prices of this stuff are high, but if you look at the margins companies are making, they're not, they're not partic profit margins are not high. In some, many cases, they're negative because of the fixed cost against the, this, what I call slow throughput. So I think part of the answer here is from a marketing perspective, you, you, you really have to segment the market in terms of a set of customers that have a top of mind need. You know, something that if you came along and said, I can help you on that, they'd say, well, I, we have to talk because I've got to solve this. So it's top of mind, it's a standard uh, solution. There's a solution spec that's common to these guys, and they reference one another when they make buying decisions. So if you can please one of them, there's a word of mouth effect that can get triggered where other people will start to call you and, and pull product. And our, our best test, whether we had this right, was always, you know, are we getting the phone calls or are we having to go out and push product? And, and we would simply keep looking and re-segmenting the market until we started getting the phone calls and the word of mouth, and we'd stimulate the word of mouth with marketing communications. So I, I think this, the game here is really about get yourself in the right space, spend time on that, not, not on the sales process per se, and, and then price it. You know, you gotta price it to make money at some level of scale, but, but if you're going to do this incrementally and say I have to be profitable on unit one, I don't think it's going to work because usually demand is price elastic you know, within some range. So you've got to find the elasticity point and, and be willing to take your price down as long as you believe you can scale into it and, and drive progress here because it's, it's, what kills you is the fixed costs against slow throughput. I mean, that's what puts these companies into the valley of death. The sales cycle point is quite important because uh, the, the end user here, whether it's a big industrial company or a utility or a government, will be slower moving. And the points of contact for the, for the marketing effort are multiple at the C level at the company, at the uh, engineering level, and at other levels. And so the marketing strategy has to be with a view to that. It also is a little bit more, depending on what part of alternative energy you're talking about, it's a little bit more relationship-based uh, than, than, uh, than other businesses we've found. So seven and eight are kind of uh, related, I guess, in some sense, too. And, and not particular necessarily clean tech. But so I think if you're trying to bring innovation and technology to create markets that haven't existed, or, or create, at the minimum, new ways of, of offering solutions to customers that haven't existed, then you're really dealing with um, uh, experiments. I mean, you can do all the market research you want. You can take all kinds of polls of people. Many of you probably found this. Until you put something in front of them, you just don't know what the reaction is going to be. And so I find that you know, at any given point in time, a company, early stage company in this sector will have a market segment where they've got traction and they have a theory about why it's working and they should have a fairly high confidence level that if we execute and repeat what we're doing, we're going to be able to drive a certain amount of sales and activity. That's what I'd call execution mode and there should be metrics and there should be accountability for delivering against that because it's known, it's been vetted. On the other hand, if you're now trying to enter a new market where you're, where you're in, in a theoretical mode, 
Look, I think these people are trying to solve this issue. I think this is top of mind. And if we can do this in terms of a solution, it's unique, it's compelling. I think this is going to catch fire. But I don't have any proof of that. That shouldn't get lumped into the forecast and the business plan and the resourcing plan with the stuff that's known. <clears throat> it, it, and expectations shouldn't be created around those two buckets uh, that, are, that are similar because, because the second one is not probabilistic. It's, it's a roll of the dice. And until you get some confirmation and you have an underlying rationale, it's just you, you shouldn't count on it. You shouldn't want anybody else to. And, <clears throat> the, the hidden danger here is if you start um, creating too much of an expectation around things that are still theoretical, uh, the investors will slam you. Uh, you'll be chastised. You'll start to send a word out to your company, we can't miss numbers, and the company will start to stop innovating. And uh, they'll seek you know, the certainty and the known. And you can't afford to do that in this sector. Because wherever you start, by definition, you got a lot of problem solving and innovation left to do. So I like to compartmentalize it and say at any point in time, we're in execution mode on a set of things. We are in an experimental mode on our next set of things. And then we've got our big vision that we don't want to lose about where, why are we doing all this? It's to get to, get to the homeland, I mean, get to nirvana here. And I keep them, I think you keep them distinct. Uh, and you drive into the organization uh, flexibility and dynamics around changing pictures. That's probably the best way to put it. Uh, OK, so uh, nine, continuous improvement. Um, I don't know how many of you guys think about this continuous improvement stuff. You know, this became cultural for us. Um, and the question really is, uh, when a company just emerges, if you think about how much you learned from when you started it to when you got into business, it's a lot, right? If you think about five years from now, well, we sure got a lot smarter and we got a lot better in 10 years. And the question is, can you accelerate those learning cycles? Because uh, it's like a human being, your capacity to learn and improve uh, it's sort of separate from the underlying things you're working on, really gates how fast you can move through all these problems. And what I find, everybody acknowledges that. It makes sense intellectually. But what you don't find too often is a focused, systematic effort within the organization to improve the capacity to learn. And, and it's two ways. It's, there's, there's external, so that's benchmarking, that's networking, and that's like collecting data, really collecting it, and bringing it back to a team in a structured way, so that, and translating it into action. And then there's internal, where you take all these things that work and don't work, and feed them back into a process that that's repeats itself frequently, that says, how, how, do, how, do we, how do we benefit from what worked and what didn't, and from the pattern recognition? And then finally, driving, creating metrics. So we, we created metrics uh, in First Solar specifically around rate of change, rate of improvement, not, not you know, cost per watt, revenue, et cetera. We had all that, but the bigger ones were how fast did we get better? How many times were you able to raise the bar you know, in the last 12 months? And there are methodologies you can wrap around that. But that I think if you look at high-performing companies, I, the two I studied uh, in depth on this, three, GE, Walmart, and Toyota, they had just this cultural, you know, uh, massive continuous improvement mechanism uh, that we tried to replicate. And uh, so I would just throw that out. The, the last point, we'll just maybe open it for some questions since we're um, out of time, is really around working with the stakeholders, having them uh, aligned and in being invested in uh, the proposition that you're offering to your customers and your investors. It's been particularly important in the renewables area uh, as uh, new markets are defined and uh, 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 the regulatory architecture is established. Uh, how about some questions? Um. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any questions. We have to go to the next presenter. <laughs> I guess no questions. We could, have, we could talk to you afterwards. <laughs>